Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome here. Um, it's really a pleasure to see so many people. Um, uh, so today we um, have the launch event of Eurofusion uh, version 2.0. Uh, so we were established in 2014. And we recently signed a new grant agreement, but because of COVID, all the parties, uh, they come a little later. So we are very happy to have a lineup of uh, very, very uh, uh, good and interesting uh, speakers. And um, so today I will guide you to the program from speaker to speaker. I didn't introduce myself. My name is Tony Donay, the program manager of Eurofusion. And um, since we are already a little late, let me introduce immediately the first speaker, who is uh, Dr. Lars Friedrichsen, who is uh, of the state uh, of Mecklenburg for Pommern and director of the representation here. And uh, yeah, we let me say also that we were very pleased to be able to have our general assembly yesterday here in this building and also to have this event here. So thank you very much for your hospitality and the kindness. So please. Dear Professor Günther, dear Minister Martin, I'm not sure if Deputy Director General Drake is already with us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the representation of Mecklenburg Western Pomerania to the European Union. It's already the second time that Eurofusion comes to this um, representation. We are very happy that you chose to come us, to us for a second time. Uh, since 2016, many things have happened, I guess. A lot of progress has been made with Eurofusion, one of the leading research networks in, in Europe. And you are presenting your groundbreaking results, and you had already a good day of discussions yesterday, I heard. I'm very happy that you profited from these wonderful premises, a lot of fresh air and a lot of space, so you can keep your social distance while talking to each other after so many years of being at home. We tried to get together 2021. We had to cancel that on short notice in December because we were in the third or fourth wave of the corona pandemic. Today, I think the situation is excellent. A lot of fresh air and you can enjoy um, the results of, uh, pardon me, the, the General Assembly yesterday and the conference today without being at risk of any uh, infection of any kind. Your research is aiming to solve one of mankind's um, main problems, energy resources, energy production for the future, while at the same time producing no nuclear waste, no greenhouse gas, and no money in the pockets of any autocratic state. All of this through reprodu reproducing um, the process of the sun here on Earth. I, I think I have never heard of any more ambition in a science project than that. I'm really impressed. I'm only a lawyer. I really am looking forward to listen to what you have to say, what your results are, when you will be ready to produce the energy that um, will be our f energy future. So I, what I know is that we need a strong support in this project. You need this network and you need the European Commission uh, that finances this project for many years now. And you said you already have a new grant for the future. And I think uh, Mrs. Drake will be here any minute to talk about that. Um, we have a long list of distinguished speakers, so I will keep myself very short today. Um, I'm, I will introduce my minister, Bettina Martin, who is responsible for science, culture, federal and European affairs at the ministry of the same name in Schwerin, Mecklenburg, Western Pomerania. Um, it's our pleasure to work for you, Minister, for the European endeavors in the years to come. And if I talk about we, I'll just briefly introduce my colleagues in a small but very dedicated represent representation, Dr. Silvia Fölzer, Petra Götz and Alexander Manewitz, who worked um, for quite a while to bring this together and to help you uh, have two successful days. So without, without any further ado, I give the floor to Minister Martin and I wish you an excellent day. Thank you again for being with us.
Dear Professorin Günther, dear Mrs. Drake, we're very happy that you've made your way here to our representation. A very well, warm welcome to all of you. We're very honored that uh, we can be the host here to the Eurofusion event here in Brussels. I would like to offer you a very well, warm welcome and the warmest greetings from the state government and under the leadership of Manuela Schwesig, the Prime Minister. We are particularly honored uh, that you chose to hold your event here at the representation of the state Mecklenburg, uh, Mecklenburg Western Pomerania. And we do think you chose the perfect location because what you are talking about, what you are doing your research in, the fusion, uh, is something that our state um, prides itself in having uh, the location in Greifswald where the IPP is working, where the IPP has been doing research. And I, I do believe that we can be proud of the of, to be the home of Wendelstein 7X, the world's leading stellarator facility at the Max Planck IPP branch in Greifswald. And I am very uh, much looking forward to Professor Sibylle Günther's uh, presentation to find out more about the, the current uh, situation and, and the newest findings. And I, I do think that you all have a highly interesting topic you are dedicating your work because especially nowadays where we are talking about energy security more than ever I might, might dare say here in Europe uh, especially you are thinking about the future maybe not about uh, the upcoming winter where we are all very interested in finding out how it will be but um, you're talking about long-term uh, perspective and long-term chances and that's of course highly interesting. The research conducted at IPP is part of the European Fusion Program and welcomes research, researchers from all over Europe. It has formed a remarkable footprint in fusion research worldwide over the course of almost 30 years. Around 400 highly qualified staff research Wendelstein 7X operations and other stellarator related topics. It is interconnected with the Department of Physics at the University of Greifswald with its workforce of about 1,100 in Greifswald and Garching combined. IPP is one of the largest fusion research centers in Europe. Dear members of Eurofusion, the European Commission trusts in Eurofusion in you, the, and so does the state government of Mecklenburg Western Pomerania. IPB's status of appointed coordinator for Eurofusion recognizes the strong record of IPP in fusion research. Europe has ambitious plans of the limitation of climate change impacts and an overall decarbonization of energy production. Mecklenburg Western Pomerania is deeply committed to these goals and I just said it, it's now more current than ever. The state has become a net exporter of renewable energies. Wind and solar energy can fully meet the state's energy needs. Renewable energy in excess of this is regularly fed into the grid. Fusion energy would give us an even more sustainable form of energy production. We therefore recognize it with great pleasure that Eurofusion su successfully applied for the grant of the latest research program. Fusion research is a prime example of pan-European scientific effort. Cooperation is the key to a cleaner, more sustainable, more prosperous and more peaceful future of energy production and consumption. Dear ladies and gentlemen, they are about to take the next steps on the road to fusion energy, we depend on your exceptional scientific research and development skills. We still need to deepen our understanding of fusion and the development of technologies and materials needed for an operational fusion reactor of large scale. Germany supports these efforts with its broad fusion research approach at IPP in Greifswald and Garching. The Institute of Energy and Climate Research in Jülich and the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. 
Dear ladies and gentlemen, I am confident that you will work for a better and more sustainable future. I wish you a very enlightening and successful, constructive day today. I am hoping that you are having a good and comfortable time here today in our representation. We are proud to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Bettina Bantin, for your very nice words and giving us a lot of inspiration. And it's good that the politics um, is, is supporting us. And thanks for coming all the way from, um, uh, what is it, <laughs> sorry, Mecklenburg for Pommern, all the way to here. Uh, so we now go and hear the European view from uh, Director, Deputy Director General, uh, Ms. Joanna Drake, uh, so who will give us the European view, so please. There's unfortunately no stairs, but I can help you. Thank you very much for the leg up. <laughs> Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, pleasure for me to be here. Um, dear uh, Dr. Friedrichsen, dear Minister Bettina Martin, it is indeed a pleasure to take part in this Eurofusion launch event and celebrate with you the European progress in fusion. I would like to start with some congratulations to all the scientists to all the engineers from the Eurofusion Consortium for their recent breakthrough last February. It set a worldwide record for sustained fusion energy at the joint European Taurus facility, the JET. Providing energy from fusion might not be like what we read about all the time, but it is something which I think is more and more now on people's radars as we talk a lot and are very ambitious towards getting alternative sources of energy. Therefore, providing this type of energy is in an efficient, economical and environmentally friendly way is one of the grand challenges for engineering in the 21st century. This result at JET clearly demonstrates the potential for fusion energy to deliver sustainable and abundant low carbon energy. It also demonstrates that European scientists and engineers are worldwide leaders in fusion, and I would like to thank them so much for their hard work. But now please allow me a few reflections on a number of, shall we say, pet topics. Minister Martin already referred uh, to climate change and how much more topical the subject is. And I think we need to even more put it in the common equation, if you like, and blend um, of the thinking of common citizens when they think about what's the solution out there? What's the responsibility? But how can I also ensure that I'm part of that challenge in order to get to the ambition? The grand challenge of our lifetime, energy affordability and climate change, and fighting climate change and achieving a clean energy transition. This is all a dream that I think more and more citizens now dream about. So the supply of clean energy will be a deciding factor for limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Last year's COP26 has shown us just how much that goal remains within reach, but the path to the decarbonisation is steep and also a very steady climb, so lots of resilience. This is particularly important following the Paris Agreement and the EU commitment to lead the way in decarbonising the economy and tackling global climate change. In this framework, it is important to note that fusion was highly represented for the first time at the COP. In line with the European Green Deal, Europe should be the first carbon neutral continent in the world by 2050. The EU should accelerate now its path of reducing by 55% its greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, while ensuring our independence in terms of energy sources. 
The global energy market disruption caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine has added a further challenge to this endeavor. It requires us to drastically accelerate our transition to clean energy transition and energy independence. As a response to this disruption, the European Commission has recently proposed the Repower EU plan to make Europe independent from Russian fuel, fossil fuels well before 2030, in the light of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. EU leaders have agreed on this objectives adopted in May, which demonstrates the urgency to address the reliability of energy supply. With energy accounting for more than two-thirds of EU, EU's emissions, it is clear that decarbonizing the energy system is essential to meet our objectives. For this purpose, we need all carbon neutral technologies, and it is up to the member states to choose the energy mix. Fusion, though, has enormous potential to play an important role as a long-term solution in achieving a carbon neutral energy mix. It fits perfectly with the overall objective of long-term zero carbon emissions. A few words now on cooperation and EU funding. At this point, I would like to comment on the achievements in international cooperation in fusion. I can confidently say that fusion research is an example of a fully integrated international effort. Yes, we can prove that it is possible, and we can, and we can even achieve better. Globally, this is represented by ITER, and at European level, by the Eurofusion Consortium and Fusion for Energy. International collaboration has always been, is, and always will be a key element to deliver major scientific results, not only in fusion, but in all fields of science. Strengthened coordination and synergies promote scientific and technological excellence and enhances industrial competitiveness in international cooperation helps develop even more effective solutions to the many challenges of our planet. The major results in future research have been accomplished thanks to the EU's continued financial support during the past seven years, both under the Eurofusion Grant Agreement and the new contract for the operation of the JET facilities, the NJOC. Indeed, the EU fully recognises the value and potential of fusion energy. It has been a strong supporter of fusion research through the Eurotom Research and Training Programme. <clears throat> Eurotom has been the framework in which, for more than 60 years, knowledge and competence in nuclear science and technology have been developed in Europe, from basic research to innovative systems and solutions. During the past seven years, the Europe, Euratom programme has effectively and efficiently contributed to the progress of the European Fusion Roadmap, including to JET's scientific exploitation and operation. The European Fusion Roadmap from, forms the basis of the Eurofusion programme with the aim to make available as early as possible fusion power as a source of electricity. To date, the EU has been investing through Eurotom 100 million euros per year. Under the current Eurotom research and training programme for 2021 to 25, the EU will contribute more than half a billion euro to fusion research and development. Most of the budget is implemented through a co funded partnership with the Eurofusion Consortium. Final thoughts about education training and the collaboration between academic research and industry. Fusion research has come a long way, but today we are at an important crossroad. It is transitioning, like a lot of other things, from fundamental science in plasma physics to a technological and industrial reality. We therefore need to ensure that knowledge and technology move forward as quickly as possible. Let me highlight, therefore, especially in this year dedicated to youth, what I consider a decisive aspect for our future, the development of advanced skills as a key condition 
to boost European competitiveness and build a more inclusive, green and digital future. I would rather think, want to think about skills not as an add-on, but really as an integrated part from the start to even the acceleration of this uh, project. The Eurofusion partnership will deliver the necessary knowledge, prepare European teams for the exploitation of ITER, and provide training through a new generation of fusion scientists and engineers. ITER has started its assembly in Cadarache, on the south of France, and many industries across Europe and the world provide state-of-the-art systems and components. ITER is already delivering concrete opportunities for industry and is having a positive effect on jobs, growth and innovation. In a few years, ITER will start operation and will provide many more exciting opportunities for scientists and engineers. Concerning innovation, I would like to underline Eurotom's concrete support for fusion R&D for almost a decade now, with the European Prize for Innovation in Fusion, the so-called Soft Innovation Prize. Since its launch eight years ago, a total of 10 prizes have been awarded to outstanding researchers and industries who find innovative solutions possibly with wider applications to the huge challenges of fusion. And we look forward indeed to the fifth edition of the prize that will be awarded at the SOFT conference in September in Dubrovnik. It is also important to keep in mind that for fusion to be successful, we need young talents. Human capital is an overarching element of research. Young scientists and engineers should be encouraged to discover fusion research and pursue the careers in this field, and I would say early enough. They will play an important role in the exploitation of ITER and on the road towards DEMO. We need, therefore, to maintain and further develop the technological leadership and excellence of our fusion research community, as well as the European industrial know-how. For this reason, education and training are essential elements of the Eurotom program to guarantee the transfer of knowledge and experience to the next generation. We must therefore work jointly with the industry partners, universities and research institutes to deliver the timely realization of our ambitious goals with an eye to our grand challenge of climate change and energy security. The ambitions are very high, that is acknowledged. The rate of progress and success though will depend on financial and human resources, stakeholder support, innovation and industry engagement. With a strong support, fusion could become a reliable source of carbon-free electricity in Europe in the second half of this century. A commercial fusion power plant could be part of the future energy mix. I would therefore like to conclude on this very optimistic note and wish you all a successful launch event today and continued success in your research and others. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Drake, uh, for putting this in uh, fusion in a wider perspective. And of course, we on our hand do our best to not disappoint all the politicians and work hard to achieve the final goals. Now it's, it's time to look back at what your fusion has been doing during the Horizon 2020 framework and who is a better person to basically present that than uh, Prof Professor Sibylle Gunther who has been the first chair of uh, your fusion when it was set up in 2014 and then later she uh, continued as, as co-chair. So um, she will now give us a look back in what we achieved during the last uh, seven years and then we go further. Dear Minister Martin, dear Dr. Friedrichsen, thank you for the nice words and in particular that you welcomed us here. So I only heard very nice um, words on, on that, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Drake, as well, for your very competent and uh, very encouraging words about our fusion research. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear guests, 
Uh, it's my pleasure to provide a brief overview of our Horizon 2020 research. And um, as most of you know, Fusion has always been a prime example of uh, a coordinated European research from its start, actually. And uh, we even wanted to deepen this collaboration further, and therefore we founded in 2013 the Eurofusion Consortium. We have started with um, 27 countries, now it's in a sense 28, with 25 member states of uh, the European Union. Ukraine is an associate member. And as of today, we have two kind of not yet associated members. So Switzerland and UK have been full members of our consortium as they have been associated to Horizon 2020. We still hope this will work out also for Horizon Europe. For the time being, they are associated via my home institution. So we still collaborate um, because we just have a collaboration agreement between IPP and Switzerland and UK. Well, it's not only the about 30 research institutions who are members of our consortium. We have a lot of uh, third party involvement, in particular about 150 universities, and thus we have about 800 master students and PhD students in our program. And altogether it's about 4,000 researchers or support staff that are engaged in our consortium. So it's quite a lot of um, brain and person power involved, and so we are very happy that we can do that. Well, as we just heard, Fusion is a long-term endeavor, and therefore we take great care of our young generation. We, for example, provide fellowships for particularly talented researchers and engineers. We support PhD students. We um, allow all of these young scientists to exploit world-leading facilities, and this is the only way to get world-leading research results in our field. And together with uh, FuseNet, we also involve our youngsters, so to say, so the bachelor and master students. Ms. Rick has already mentioned our roadmap to fusion electricity. Actually, before we started with our consortium, we developed a roadmap to fusion electricity, with at the moment, of course, our cornerstone also mentioned already the ITER project that uh, is so fascinating because we expect ITER to demonstrate that we can generate much more energy out of fusion reactions than we put into the plasma for heating. Nowadays, we use all existing facilities in Europe to prepare for either operation. And of course, we also learn a lot of technology uh, from the uh, in-kind contributions that are being uh, brought to ITER and have been um, produced also to learn something about the demonstration power plant. There's a lot of other technologies to deal with, in particular materials research, because we want materials that withstand the harsh environments in a fusion power plant. And as Ms. Martin already uh, discussed, we also follow the Stellarator route. So ITER and uh, DEMO are so far at least Drucker Max, um, with all its advantages, in particular it's a, it's a more advanced technology than the Stellarator, but we want to find out if the Stellarator would also make a fusion power plant or maybe even more economic. So this is one of the research topics along this roadmap as well. Well, we just discussed that we are using all our facilities uh, within Europe, and this is one of the new elements of our Eurofusion Consortium. We have always been using, of course, the Jet European Taurus in UK, because it's already from its start has been a European machine. So this was obvious that we all went there. But now we integrated also the national facilities into our program and now can make use of their, all their strengths to make a more broad picture of our plasma physics. So for example, we are using the very flexible Tokamak TCV in Switzerland, the Aztec Subgrid Tokamak in Garching, the, the must upgrade um, Tokamak in UK and the West Tokamak in France. And we are very delighted that more family members come in here in the near future. So the Compass upgrade in Czech Republic and the DT2 Tokamak in Italy. And in addition, in a sense to replace the jet Tokamak that is aging a little, uh, we are very fascinated by the chance to have a new superconducting Tokamak of the jet size. 
and this will be uh, available to us in Japan, GT60 SA, and this will be a joint collaboration between Europe and Japan to exploit this uh, GT60 SA tokamak also to prepare ITER and demo operation. And as uh, Ms. Drake already said, we are a very international community, so this is also something we are very, very much looking forward. And then, as what also mentioned already by Ms. Drake, uh, we were very happy to be able to kind of announce a world record in fusion energy. Actually, it has been achieved in December last year. We announced it in March, or in February this year, actually. And here you see the fusion power as a function of time. And the red one is what we are talking about. And in total, we extracted f 59 um, megajoule energy. And it's not about this amount of energy. It's not so huge. What is really fascinating about it is that we needed 170 microgram of fuel. And that is the weight of a grain of sand, one grain of sand. If you wanted to extract as much energy by, for example, burning lignite, you would need four kilograms. So this is a million times more energy you get out of our fuel, which is so ex efficient that we are really, that's the reason why we are so keen on fusion energy. You don't need much fuel, and it's worldwide available for everyone. And there's no reason to have any wars about these resources any longer. So this is what motivates us. Well, and then, as already mentioned by Minister Martin, uh, I'm, of course, particularly proud that we uh, started operation of the world modest uh, and leading asteroid facility, Wendel Trend 7X, in 2015. And we are very happy that it really exceeded all our dreams expectations uh, by setting already immediately kind of the world record for stellar rated performance. So this is something we will start operation in September again. And so we are looking forward to new results of stellar rated research and start the race between Tokamak and stellar raters. And let's, let's hope that both win in a sense that there are options towards the fusion power plant. Well, but it's not only just by exploiting experiments. We want to go towards ITER and to a fusion power plant. And therefore, we really need to under, deeply understand what is happening in our devices, because we cannot just put the same parameters in our devices and, and just study this. Then this wouldn't make sense. So we really have to extrapolate from, from the observations we see at our devices towards uh, a power plant. And so this requires deep understanding of what we're observing right now. And therefore, we need a coordinated theory and simulation program as well. And this is something that has strongly deepened uh, this coordination during the last framework program. We have established five uh, advanced comp computing hubs, one in Finland, one in Poland, one in Germany, one in Switzerland, and one in Spain. And we are very happy that we are allowed to use the high performance computing facility at Cineca in Italy. So this is another very coordinated research activity of Eurofusion. And then we looked at one particular topic um, in more detail, and that is the heat exhaust of our devices. We have plasmas of a temperature of 100 to 200 million degrees. This is 10 times more than in a solar interior. And therefore, if you wouldn't do anything, we would have to face with heat fluxes that would be similar to the, so to the, to the solar surface. So this is nothing that you want to deal with. We have metallic walls at the, at the edge. Uh, but of course, we did have already solutions for that. And we demonstrated this in all the diverter talker marks and, for example, the jet. And we are pretty sure that this will work also in ITER and maybe also in DEMO, probably even. But nevertheless, prob probably is not enough. And also the question is, are there more clever solutions then? And so we um, started, a, again, coordinated upgrade of facilities uh, to upgrade those facilities to try out more advanced or maybe silly other solutions. We are scientists and see if we can find better solutions how to deal with the heat exhaust of the facilities. And I'm very curious how this will work out. So these facilities um, are at the moment in the upgrade process mostly, and we will see the results during Horizon 2020. And another highlight uh, we can celebrate today is that the demo preconceptual design has finished, and they had a really uh, harsh uh, review panel, so they really went through a thorough uh, review process uh, with very positive remarks. 
and uh, the results of their work has been published in 25 peer-reviewed um, papers and they have been collected into a, a special issue of the Fusion Engineering and Design Journal. Well, you see, actually we can say mission accomplished. We have uh, established the Eurofusion Consortium uh, very successfully, I would say. We have achieved nearly all milestones we have set and I have reported three major uh, achievements. One has been the deuterium tritium campaign with a world record of fusion energy. The other one was that we started uh, the most modern stellarator experiment, Wendelstein 7X, and we, for example, finished the demo preconceptual design study. Well, with this, I would like to thank in particular our stakeholders, of course, the European Commission and the national governments who uh, contributed funding, by the way, also Mecklenburg, Western Pomerania, to, uh, con for, for, our, for their continued funding because such a long-term endeavor, of course, is, uh, needs security in, 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 in funding. I would like also to thank our colleagues from ITER, Fusion for Energy, and FUSENET for the great collaboration, and all of you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sibylle. Actually, maybe I can add that yesterday in the General Assembly, we came to the conclusion that 98.6% of all the deliverables which we promised to the European Commission to be delivered by the end of the program have been achieved. So there's only a few open which we will close in the coming few months. So uh, with that, so thank you, Sibylle, for looking back and, and telling us what we have achieved. And now Ambrogio Fasoli, who is the chair of um, uh, the General Assembly, and he was yesterday uh, chosen to continue as a chair also for the next uh, two and a half years. Uh, so he will give us a uh, look forward and uh, see what we are doing in Horizon Eurofusion. Uh, sorry, Horizon, yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Tony. The, uh, German and European authorities, dear colleagues, dear friends. It's uh, my privilege today to say a few words about the coming program, which we have, in fact, already started, building on a continuity and on a success that we have obtained in Horizon 2020, as described by, by Sibyl. So we are really moving to next level along the European uh, Fusion uh, work map, Roadmap. So. Our uh, adaptation, as we say, it's an evolution of the program, not a revolution, because fusion needs continuity, needs also adaptation of the priorities in the program. And just to visualize the way we have evolved, I just put up the two pie charts of our uh, resources. Of course, everything passes through the resources. And uh, without going to any details, you can see that the orange part, which is the part in which we concentrate on the, like the power plant of the uh, demonstration of uh, the technology that needs to be in place for a reactor. This is part has, is expanding um, without disregarding the fusion science part because we also still need to solve scientific problems that are required, uh, the solutions which are required, uh, required for understanding, predicting, and controlling our little star that will give us energy. First and foremost, speaking of the objectives that we have for the uh, coming uh, framework program, is ITER. Of course, ITER will demonstrate the scientific and technological feasibility of fusion and its safety. And as consortium, as Eurofusion, we are committed to contributing and uh, to the construction and to the preparation of ITER. We call it commissioning. As you can see from the picture, we are almost there. We also would like to prepare as concerns, but also together with all the stakeholders uh, in Europe, the ITER operation. We also need to talk to our international partners so that we will form really one team in Europe and around the world, across all the continents, to operate and extract as much information as we need from ITER, which is still an experiment in a sense. Speaking still of ITER, we want to really optimize the chances of its success. And we want to do that by using all the possible tools that we have, all the experiments 
and experimental devices that we have today, we still need to address some issues that are important to optimize the operation of ether, what we call burning plasma physics, so this, this behavior of this complex system that is this little star we're trying to trap an energy, get energy from, we need to control it, we need to make sure the interaction with the wall are also benign, we need to extract the heat in a, in a safe way. And we do that uh, in a number of ways. We have some milestones that I'd like to highlight in a simplified uh, way. For this coming period, we have the final campaigns on JET. JET is still uh, operating in this uh, first part of the uh, framework program. We have the campaigns on what we call the medium science tokamaks across Europe, and, this, and by Europe I mean actually uh, even more than European Union. As uh, was uh, described before, there are concentrated campaigns to solve some of the issues in different uh, places, but we do that in a coordinated way since the beginning of Eurofusion. So we don't duplicate things, we optimize the use of resources, including human resources, to conduct these experiments. We will also see, in this framework program, the first experiments on the Japan uh, uh, machine, JT60 Super Upgrade, to which we, as Europeans, uh, contribute as well as the first operation on the Compass Upgrade Tokamak in the Czech Republic, and the final steps of the first plasmas in the Italian experiment uh, Divert Test Tokamak, or DTT. Some of the slides have a little bit of an overlap with the previous uh, speaker, of course, but that's on purpose because we don't have hiatus between the two periods. We have continuity and improvements. Um, and one of the overlaps is about these advanced computing hubs, which are in full force now. We have some that do high performance computing, some that do core, one that does code integration, and one that does data management. And just to, make a, uh, to give an example of the success that's been reached already now, at the very beginning of this program, I just put uh, a visualization of a simulation of the uh, load of the particles that are in ITER that actually impinge on the surfaces inside the vessel of ITER. We need to make sure that it's not too much power in one localized spot, for example, because that would create damage. But most importantly here, we also see that by having this approach jointly across Europe, how to optimize the uh, computing for, for example, this problem, we have reduced the execution time of these simulations by a huge factor by going to a modern architecture for the computing facilities. One of the objectives for Horizon Europe is to continue advancing the Stellarator as an alternative approach to fusion power plant, and it will be a very important milestone in this period, which will be the restarting of the Wendenstein 7X activities, but in a configuration which has a very important uh, novelty, which is an actively cooled diverter, so it's a piece that will uh, remove heat uh, from uh, the, the plasma in which there will be a coolant that will circulate. This has not been done before anywhere else. We will also focus on a very important aspect that is an aspect related to materials. It is a big challenge for fusion, obviously, and that is to contribute to the design and the construction of a, a source of neutrons which simulates the characteristics of the neutrons that are produced by fusion reactions, which we will have in a real reactor, and therefore enable us to understand how we will tame the effect of these neutrons on the materials that will surround uh, the plasma, and we hope, and this uh, uh, we look forward to this decision of starting the construction of this device in the south of Spain, if if Donetsk, for uh, producing uh, again neutrons that simulate what will happen in a fusion reactor to optimize our choice of materials and to understand what will happen and predict uh, their uh, resilience to the neutron fluxes. One point that we will concentrate on as well is innovation and industry. We want to promote innovation, and we want to promote the industrial, uh, industrial competitiveness in Europe for, for fusion. We do that in a couple of ways, or uh, at least I can mention a couple of examples in, of ways that we do that. First of all, we want to strengthen the technology transfer and development of spin-offs. I'll show you a few examples that are already demonstrating that we do that. These are spin-offs in different fields. In health, for example, we're using superconductor uh, facility, superconducting uh, technology for medical resonance imaging. In material sciences, we, knew, we use techniques uh, to form 3D metal uh, components, 
of course, develop for fusion. We use them to create cockpits for aeronautics. In the environment uh, field, we use uh, palladium alloy membranes to treat effluents from chemical and uh, automobile industries. These, of course, were developed, again, in the context of fusion R&D. And uh, the last example, not least, of course, is the remote handling, where we had to develop uh, state-of-the-art uh, facilities and, and, uh, and know-how for jet specifically, and that is being applied already to a variety of fields, including high-energy physics, uh, space, nuclear, and even uh, medicine. And one other thing we like to do, and we are doing already in this new Freeman program, is to open our door to public-private partnerships in order to expand and facilitate our work program. One key objective, in addition to ITER, for this Freeman program is to complete the demo conceptual design. We worked on a pre-conceptual design in the pre previous uh, framework program. Now we want to go to the conceptual design. And I believe this is unique in the, in the world. By demo, we mean a facility that will demonstrate not only the scientific and, and technological feasibility of fusion, but also its commercial potential. A few hundred megawatts of fusion power, close fuel cycle, a plant that will be available uh, most of the time as opposed to a scientific experiment, if you like. So we wish to capitalize on the intrinsic safety features of fusion and bring the relevant critical technology to technologies to an adequate maturity. Also with an eye to keep the cost of electricity under control in order, again, for a future commercial uh, development. We do that following the recommendations of the exercise that was conducted in FP8, as mentioned before, this uh, demo uh, gate review, it gave us very uh, specific set of recommendations and we are committed to uh, following them. I mentioned the, the most important ones. We need to move, as far as demo is uh, concerned, from research-oriented to design-driven. So we really want to focus on the device at the end. We need to set up a demo central team to do that, which we have already done. And we need to address a number of critical problems. I mentioned a few, what we call plasma scenarios. I promise I won't go into any details, but this little star in our, our magnetic edge is misbehaving sometimes. We need to really control it from the beginning to the end, and the beginning to the end is not billions of years like a normal star, but it's minutes and hours. And we need to make sure there is no uh, violent events that may uh, put at risk the long, uh, term the duration of the components that are there to hold the plasma together. We need to make sure we reproduce, we produce the fuel uh, we need, tritium, so we call this breeding blanket, and the technology of that is a very uh, challenging uh, element. Again, we need to promote remote maintenance and uh, all uh, elements in the uh, demo uh, device will need to be, or most elements will need to be compatible with uh, remote uh, maintenance. And we also need to have in, in mind, not the details, of course, of the building as we will build it in, in a number of decades because that would be premature, but we need to have in mind that we need to have a layout of the building that makes sense with all the components together and actually forms a, a reactor together. We also need to, again, increase cost consciousness. It goes with, with the transition from, if you like, research to project oriented. And one important thing is also I'd like to mention, we need to maintain, in terms of industrial policy, the industrial supply chain between it and them and not having too big a gap that will jeopardize our capability to construct the device. We need to work on knowledge management and retention strategy and develop an adequate licensing plan because that is one of the uh, things that may slow down fusion development in the future if we don't attack it adequately. And last but not least, the panel reminded us, like many speakers today, that one thing that we do for sure, and we need to do for sure, is to train the next generation of fusion scientists and engineers. And I also like to mention that as one of our main objectives, again, element of continuity, but also element of improvement, we have a new joint training uh, programs to prepare the ITER and demo generation of scientists, engineers, and operators, so we don't have to forget uh, that there's not just the pure scientists that look at the plasma physics aspect of things, but really it's all about engineering and operating um, the device. And we are very uh, delighted to have a little gesture that we can make from our side 
to honor the memory of Dr. Bernard Bigot, who has been Director General of ITER from 2015 to 2022, who unfortunately passed away a month and a half ago or something like that, um, to whom we owe a lot as a community in Europe and worldwide. And so we named our research grants for young, promising, brilliant scientists uh, in his name. We have uh, about 10 of them per year, as we have maybe a little more than that, about 15 per year of engineering grants. So we form also in engineers in specific niches where we uh, anticipate the need of. All, all in all, we have uh, many hundreds of PhD students involved with our program. I mentioned one thing um, that I think is, uh, is anecdotal, but is interesting. We have launched uh, in our university a, what we, what we call a massive open online course on plasma physics and fusion. I thought it was an effort that was maybe too, too, too big for what it was worth. And uh, to this day, we have 40,000 enrolled students around the world. So that is to say that the world is thirsty of knowledge and of being exposed to fusion science and, and technology. And as mentioned before, we also go a little bit younger than PhD students. We really want to promote uh, fusion and uh, related science and technologies at the levels of bachelor and, and master. One event is, is not uh, in itself a, a R&D output, but it's an important event that will take place in this framework program is what we call a facilities review. That is an exercise we will need to, ident uh, to carry out to identify the facilities in science and in technology that are needed uh, for uh, our R&D in the uh, next framework programs, plural. The output of which will be uh, used to form the basis for decisions to support and uh, foster rapid and efficient development of fusion as an energy source. So the pictures here are pictures of different facilities just to remind ourselves that we're talking about all kinds of facilities from plasma science to technology remote handling, all, all sorts of, sort of activities. So two words in conclusion. First of all, I think we can say that despite, despite tight boundary conditions, the complicated political issues across uh, Europe, we have been able to launch an ambitious plan for Horizon Europe, but also for beyond Horizon Europe. And the idea is to implement, the goal is to implement the European Fusion Roadmap. And I want to uh, conclude with one uh, word. Uh, in Fusion R&D and in our consortium, I think a key word is integration. I, I also noticed that uh, previous speakers have used this uh, same word. Uh, integration at all levels, integration of various fields of science and technology, integration of reactive forces are focused R&D, but also spin-offs, other applications of what we do, integration of academic and industrial approaches, integration of what we can say consolidation of knowledge on one hand, but also innovation on the other hand. It would be a mistake to close the door to innovation and then say we know everything and then we just need to build a reactor. Integration of many systems, obviously, for the power plant. And on the human side, it's also very, very important to say it's an integration of different human generations. Not many endeavors in our society go so much across generations like fusion does. And of course, integration of all the beneficiaries, associates, and partners. And I, I don't repeat all these nice words that Sibyl has said, but I, of course, join myself to the thanks that she has mentioned for uh, all the partners and all associates. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambrogio, for this uh, inspirational uh, look forward. I, I don't like to correct the speaker, but I need to do it. Uh, you said DEMO will have three to 500 megawatt of fusion power. Actually, it will be about two gigawatt of fusion power and three to 500 megawatt electric. So that's the net electricity which we want to deliver to the grid. Slightly different, but um, we um, have already heard from various speakers that your fusion, uh, well, part of the budget we get from the European Commission, which is roughly half, and the other half needs to come from the national matching from the different countries. Uh, and um, we are very grateful with that. Uh, we will now hear from um, a speaker from one of the somewhat smaller um, beneficiaries in Eurofusion from Finland, and that's uh, Dr. Thomas Tala. 
uh, how, uh, what role your fusion has been playing in setting up FinFusion. So, Thomas, please. Thank you very much, Tony. Dear audience, I was very delighted to have this talk, and it's actually a direct continuation where uh, Professor Fasoli finished his talk because he was talking about integration, how integration is important, and the question has always been if there's a room for a smaller country that doesn't have any of own fusion facilities, can we still do contribute somewhat useful, usefully to the big project like Europe Fusion? So that's the basics of, of my uh, talk. And, and so the title is Eurofusion in, fin in Finland's FinFusion program. And I introduced shortly FinFusion is like an umbrella that covers all the fusion uh, research in Finland. VTT is the Eurofusion beneficiary, but FinFusion is larger. In it includes universities and, and companies and, and participation, participation, to, uh, participation in F4E project as well. So let me go a little bit beyond the Eurofusion era because it's actually it actually makes the point better towards the end, as you will see. So I start uh, from the year, basically, when I was born as well, but it happened to be the year when uh, VTT established a project called Fusion Project, and it started from nothing. And, and in the, I actually had a great time last week. I went through all, all sort of papers that were written in the 70s and 80s in Finland, and I tried to figure out what the hell is, was going on because I couldn't find really a link between what they did at the time in Fusion and, and what, what we are doing now in Euraton program. So uh, oh, we had like four people working on Fusion in 70s and even 80s, so it was tiny, absolutely tiny program, basically almost nothing. And, and, and then things started to change in 90s when it became evident that Finland wants to join EU. And, and that happened actually in, in 1995. So just before that, Finland was allowed to send an engineer to net team in Garsing, and, and that started to make you know, the integration uh, taking place in, in mid-90s. And, and then after Finland joined EU, it became possible to do Eurotom research, and, and things changed quite rapidly. We had this F-Fusion program for more than 10 years having uh, many organizations participating. VTT was always the kind of coordinator in, 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 in that area. Uh, and then after good, res good research and useful research, I would say we were out of sudden allowed to host even a European facility, this DTP2, Diverted Test Platform 2 at VTT Tampere that came from FRE, but without, I would say without the Euratom work, there wouldn't have been any chance to you know, be, win this bid to get a, a DTP2. And then the, uh, there, is, there was the birth of FinFusion together with Eurofusion. So FinFusion was as a consortium uh, uh, founded for Eurofusion work. And, and you will see also what happened later in this framework program towards the end. So I just showed what happened in the Jurassic time. I call it Jurassic time. And, and I took just, I read maybe five papers last week briefly. And I enjoyed myself a lot trying to understand what they did. And that was very, you know, probably scientifically very, very high level work, but I couldn't find any link whatsoever what they did in the 70s and 80s in the Finnish fusion program and, and what Eurotom is doing right now or probably even at the time. And it was actually not easy being outside EU. It was not possible to really collaborate. So the collaboration was done mainly with, with Canadians and Americans at the time. And so there were some exchange even of people going to US. Now it became possible to join EU and, and the Finnish research unit was founded in 1995. And as you see here, the graph. So we had four participants right from the beginning. VTT was coordinating and, and three other universities. And, and then um, quite a few companies joined right away as well because there was a lot of enthusiasm. Yeah, wow, now, now we are in EU. We can go to Euratom, we can go to Jet. And, and stuff like that. So you can, you can see here the kind of Finnish fusion research funding or expensive as a function of time in, in 90. So, and this is in Finnmark, which is like one of uh, six Finnmark is like a euro. So you see there is a factor of uh, 10 increase in four years in, in research activity, fusion research activities once Finland joined the EU uh, in 1995. So that made a clear change. 
And, and, and from the very beginning, the Commission, I think, uh, also guided us that why not to concentrate a little bit more on technology rather than physics, because there were many other countries concentrating on physics, and that's what happened, apparently, at the time. I actually joined uh, Fusion Research, incidentally, in 1995, just two months after Finland joined the EU. I started a summer student job as a second-year undergraduate student, and, and I'm, on, I'm still on that way, by the way. So, Finland, uh, uh, we, we tried to find out what sort of technologies could be useful for fusion and, and, and went through many different companies and, and, and universities on, on the technology side. So, here are some examples of what we could, and, and the specific part is that the fusion physics program was only half percent of the total Euratom uh, uh, contribution, but the technology, technology program was a, a, a little bit more than 4%. And, and, and that was very specific, and I think the Commission was very happy at the time that, okay, that, that's a good approach, go for it. Uh, just an example, there is the primary iter first wall panel that was produced in Otakumpu, uh, Otakumpu and Holming already in, in 2001, and, and they didn't know fusion. A couple of years before, they did have probably no, nobody had heard about fusion in those companies either. So, and, and, and then everything get a, another boost in 2007, when VTT won the bid to host DTP2 in Tampere. So they installed this full-size kind of uh, diverter cassette mock-up in, 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 in 2007 and 8, and it was inaugurated in 2009. And, and I would say that this would not have been possible without uh, being able to participate first in the Euratom research program on remote maintenance, and, and we actually, that was the engineer that we were allowed to send to Garsing at, in, in mid-90s that was already uh, directing towards that kind of research. So it paid off, and, and ten years later, we got first kind of experimental fusion device in, in, in Finland. Now, FinFusion was born, of course, for Eurofusion in 2014, when Eurofusion was founded. And, and we were able to, we, we continued what we already did, this robotics and remote maintenance and, and, and the modeling and participation in, Euro, in European uh, devices. But we included a, a, a lot of new projects, including like full-scale fusion power modeling with APROS code and, and many other plasma diagnostics projects from the start of the Eurofusion. And now, when uh, in this framework program, as uh, already mentioned earlier, we got this Helsinki Advanced Computing Hub, and, and that was a very big thing in Finland. I mean, Finland is still a small country, but that's like a long, uh, long-term project, maybe uh, get lasting longer than this framework program, and it, it gathers experts from several organizations under the same umbrella, and it's hosted by University of Helsinki, but it, it has actually employees from five different organizations at, at this point of time. We also got in, are now involved in safety, licensing and waste studies. VTT is very strong in fission side, and, and these kind of people are very, uh, the, the kind of work for fusion and fission are not that different, so we can exploit basically the knowledge of this fission community, and, and, and that's, that's go for uh, different demo uh, projects. And then we have built a new hot cell, hot cell facility that will be used later this year, actually, for the first time to uh, analyze the irradiated irradiated materials that are coming from uh, other partner of the Eurofusion. Here are some just examples. I, I, I think ASCOT code that was already mentioned by the, so here is an ASCOT wall design optimization for Wendelstein and, and also sign through analysis of you know what, what is dangerous, what could be dangerous for ITER first wall, first wall when you apply neutral beams. And I think the most exotic example is this fire dynamic simulations of, of a demo building, how, how the lithium and, and lithium lead can cause you know, fires in a demo buildings. And, and the last example is the hot cell that is quite new and will be used for the first time in, in Eurofusion in later this year. Now, if you look at just graphs in terms of metrics, uh, what has happened, so you, you will see on the right, on the left hand side, you see, see the research volume in euros as a function of time and, and, and those periods that I called. So you, you, you see here uh, a big, uh, you will see, you will see in 1995, 
a massive increase in, in research volume, and also as a number of researchers, so like a factor of 10, when Finland was able to join Euratom. That's the first landmark, and the second landmark is actually Eurofusion was founded in 2014, so you see another big uh, increase, both in, in volume and especially number of research, researchers involved in, in fusion research in Finland. So to summarize, you, as you saw, that there are two landmarks in Finnish fusion research. First, in 1995, when Finland joined Euratom, or was possible to join Euratom, and, and the second one by Eurofusion itself, because we were able to uh, use our expertise, especially in the fission side, uh, and apply those uh, expertise uh, to fusion, uh, especially to demo, particular demo projects. And I think, as of now, the public awareness of fusion is, is much improved in Finland in the last maybe two years. First of all, the fusion energy records helped a lot, and, and then increase in funding both nationally, but also like also not outside Europe, I think in the US and, and China, things are going quite well, and, and that's what is followed by at least in local politics in, in Finland. And then of course these new constructions of various new constructions worldwide also are helping, you know, in, in getting fusion known and fusion research done in, in Finland. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. It's always nice to see how, let's say, the fusion program is increasing and, uh, and boosting uh, in, in countries. So, um, various speakers already mentioned the interaction with, with industry. So, um, we therefore, we, we thought it would be very good to have a speaker from industry, uh, Maria Teresa uh, Dominguez Bautista. Uh, she's from Empresarios uh, Agropados, and she will now give us the view of, uh, well, basically the role of industry in fusion. So, please, Maria. Okay, good morning, everybody, representatives of the Molenberg um, land, um, rep representatives of the European Commission, um, Thank you for this invitation. It's to me a big responsibility because, as you will see, the involvement in industry, it is uh, well accepted uh, for all of us. It is like um, an objective, and representing the European industry is a big responsibility. Yes, I will try to do my best uh, to, to pass the message of how we see fusion from the perspectives of the industry. Okay. okay um, the title is uh, Role of the Industry. Okay, the first question is because we know that in certain moments they are like a competition between laboratories and industry. What does it mean, the, the industry? The industry means uh, legal entities. Uh, it should be private or just governmental support. It is not needed to be just private. But what is important is uh, that uh, it should, it's very important to face this uh, big investment to have technical and financial capacity to, to face these contracts. And also, it is not all the industries. Some industries uh, are only looking to the short term, and there is needed in the industries to join fusion to have a long-term vision and innovation. Okay. okay, then what is the driver for the, for the involvement of the industry in fusion? The driver is not the businessmen around the world, okay? Just jumping or uh, and suddenly find out that it exists or Calarats or Fusion for Energy. It is not a dream. It is not businessmen without knowing what to do. It is not the industry without any way, okay? It is real. The driver is the real determination of the European Commission in certain moments to involve the industry as the real realization of the program. Without this determination, all the businessmen and all the businesswomen around the world, it is not possible. Okay? Because it is real, the role of the industry and the involvement, it is the determination of the European Commission and the vision on having the long-term uh, uh, involvement of the industry in fusion. Okay, then it is very clear uh, in the, uh, we are reading 
the objectives of Fusion for Energy when it was created. They have uh, three main objectives, that it was the first one to deliver, of course, the commitment of delivering the procurement of uh, ITER with the involvement of the industry. It was also the objective that uh, they like to create a really competitiveness industry in Europe. And also, it is the idea of real uh, having impact in the innovation of Europe. These three main objectives were very important in the, this determination of the European Commission to import the industry. But it is also Eurofusion, because uh, you are representing Eurofusion. By the way, congratulations for the word on all of us. But even Eurofusion thinking on the real uh, research, fundamental research, that it was important. From the very beginning, it was also the idea embedded in the program on use the industry effort. Okay? There is uh, the construction for ITER support the construction for ITER, for Eurofusion, with the industry. Develop demo with the contribution of the industry. I think Gianfranco is by right here. Implementation of the materials donors with the industrial projects. Means also in the, very, in the projects like Eurofusion, the industry are also embedded. And it was a part of these objectives, it was actually action plans, means it is not just the idea in a paper of having the industry involved, it was an action plan to, uh, to develop this strategy. It was develop procurement strategy, efficiency in the procurement process. It is a lot of work to do to understand how should be the, the procurement process to be ready for the industry to be involved how to protect the property rights and also in Eurofusion how to embed it as much as possible the industry as third parties of the beneficiaries. Okay, then uh, what uh, has been the results? The results are uh, quite impressive. It is uh, already six billions of contracts uh, to the industry, about uh, 1,000 contracts uh, to the industry that this has been already issued by uh, Fusion for Energy. Okay, and this, uh, this process, it is not, um, the KPIs, the, the indicators are very satisfactory because the indicator means that the process in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the left side, there is how the process of procurement has been processed, uh, sorry for that, on, on a comparison with the, how it was planned. And actually, you can realize that they are very close, the percentage is almost 90% of the compliance. Means uh, starting a process of procurement from scratch without uh, any, anything prepared, and prepare everything to have this ratio on the procurement process compared with the, with the, with the planet, it is very good, and also, what is the, the real uh, increase uh, on the contribution of, uh, of Europe to ITER. I, I have uh, selected some pictures like that. Okay, what is the, the role of the industry? Okay, the role of the industry, in, in our view, have three important pillars. Okay. Normally, we are most focused in the last one, which is, of course, the implementation in the program of the industrial practices, but to me, it is not the most important. Probably to me, I like this more easy. It's the easy part and the, and the more natural part. What is uh, something very important is that the industry is ready uh, to share in the risk. Now I have some explanation of that. To, 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 to face this uh, very, um, uh, very big investment, you need someone to help to you to share in the risk. It is, you cannot have yourself everything done without setting the risk. You also need to integrate the skills. It has been well presented before. The skills now in Eurofusion are spread in the laboratories. Then the industry is ready to do that, and now we, we explain that. And of course, the industry uh, will implement the best practice of the industry in the realization and execution of the contracts. Okay, then what does it mean uh, setting the risk? Setting the risk means that, of course, uh, when you have uh, 
one investment, you have some liabilities, mainly when we are talking about public money, even it is more important. You cannot just put the public money without any back to you on, on what is the real, how you are using this money. Okay? Then the industry is uh, need to, to accept this risk. Okay? And I can say what has been the main achievements and is why the industry is ready to participate. Because we have got in the contracts a cap of liabilities. We are not just taking a, a liability for the total amount. We are, re, re, we are discussing with, with, the, with Fusion for Energy. Eurofusion is a little bit different yet in terms of the contract. But what are the cap of liabilities that the industry can accept? Because it, it is not that we can accept everything, okay? And we have got a maximum amount. In other contracts, we have gone by task different configurations, but in the end, we have, uh, uh, we have some liabilities cap that it is uh, acceptable. Okay? Then we have also uh, got to the acceptable liquidity damage, yes, for delay, but not for other, for other aspects, for other damage, and this is also has been very important. We have, we have the fusion for any together with us and the European Commission, has developed uh, schemes of contrast that are acceptable. When they are not very big contrast, we can go to a land sum price. When there is more big contrast, we can have framework contrast to separate in different parts. We can go to FIDIC model. Means that we, are, we have uh, got the possibility of uh, adapting the most suitable contrast scheme to be acceptable by the industry. Um, we have also included in some of the, on the contracts incentives uh, in the execution that are very important for the industry. We have uh, included the escalation of prices formula that it is also very important for the industry. And finally, we have, this is something very important for the industry also, to discuss and to accept uh, schemes of payments that uh, it is always uh, to have a positive cash flow in the company, that you are not really imposing the additional effort to the companies. Okay, this, uh, this is a very important aspect for industry. Then the second point, it is uh, integration of the skills, okay? Um, as you see, uh, like, uh, and this picture has been already used by you, <laughs> uh, there is, um, you need to put the pieces together to finally have a nice picture, but you, you have to join elements, okay? And what, is, uh, what we are doing in the, in the consortiums, and when we are facing a procurement process, then the industry is looking for what is the skills we need and where we are, and we are ready to integrate this and then to construct the fair world panels or to construct the buildings, but the buildings is just a consortium with a lot of pieces that is the knowledge that it is spread. Okay? Means that this is um, integration, is very important, it's a strong action, and now it's ongoing for demo. That is, uh, should be very, very important action. Then we have, um, uh, it is important, the, the wide of dissemination of the opportunities that the European Commission has provided to the industry with uh, sufficient time to prepare these consortiums appropriately. That is not easy because we need to understand what are the best skills. Also, the incentivization of participation of the SMEs and including laboratories. We in Spain are working with CMAT in many, many other proposals. And of course, uh, the liaison officers and also the flexibility in work in different forms, an incorporated consortium or legal entity. All of this makes possible to put the puzzle together. Without this strategy, it would not be possible. Okay, then, of course, this is uh, natural. I think everybody was imagining that it was my wording. Of course, we have uh, cost control, planning, project management, system engineering, 3D model, uh, procurement manufacturing follow-up, uh, safety analysis, risk management, advanced tools, all of these uh, best practice in, in preparing big projects is, the, is what the industry is also uh, putting in the program. Okay? Then, real, with this strategy, the impact now in fusion in Europe is very large. 
Okay, we have more than a billion so the European industry, a laboratory is more than 40,000 jobs, it is expected 80,000 jobs. Uh, we have uh, added value, companies expanding network, spin-offs, development of, of new cutting edge industrial technologies. All of this uh, is the result of this strategy that it was the determination of the involvement of the industry in the fusion program. Okay, then I would like uh, allow me that uh, I put business case because normally in the tender process we put business case, okay? Let me to put it as a business case empresarios agrupados because probably it is, uh, it is uh, representing what happened with most of the industries in Europe. Okay, then just first uh, we are uh, engineering company, construction we created in the Jurassic period in 1971. And we have been a volume with this presentation of the, of the, of the BTT. Okay, then we are leading engineering, but we are also contracting EPC. And what is important is that we have uh, very large nuclear experience from new construction to support to nuclear plants in operation and also innovation in generation for reactors. Of course, fusion technology, but also combined cycles and renewables. We are very, very strong now in renewables in Spain, including some technologies of molten salt that uh, we plan to use for them. Uh, we are internationally. What has been our way in ITER, okay? in, 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 in fusion, okay? not just in ITER? Okay, we started in the Jurassic in 1984, okay? Uh, we had a consortium, a small consortium with small activities for the, for the definition of the construction of ITER. It was the, in, in 1994 to 2000. In 2006, uh, we started with the uh, site studies for ITER in Europe, including Cadarach. Then in 2010, we signed the contract for the buildings. We are partners of the consortium uh, for all these buildings that has been appeared. We have designed the buildings, we have constructed the buildings, we have procured, and, and now we are taking over almost all the buildings to I.O. Then we have a contract, very important contract for the central system, instrumentation and control, and we have done the qualification, and now we are starting the manufacturing. Then we start with Eurofusion, with CMAT in the, in the past as third party. Uh, it is very important, mainly we focus at that time in Donetsk because it was a natural way of working with CMAT. In 2015, we signed the contract for Tokamak Cooling Water System, thermohydraulic. In 2016, Test Blanket System, connecting pipes. In 19, the uh, installation contract for the, for the uh, safety pipes in ITER. It's the TCC2 contract with Ponticelli a Cobra. In, uh, in 2019 also we signed the contract for the fair wall panels. We are going to manufacture the whole set of the fair wall panels of ITER. Uh, that is, uh, is 214, it is in between two consortiums. Also, we have, uh, we have an specific uh, framework contract for the European Commission that is part of the strategy of uh, why we can really integrate more of the industry and they prepare for us, uh, for us for a competition, but finally we, we win the contract, an specific contract on the industry. And finally, I hope to work a lot uh, in Horizon. <laughs> we already have started on that. Eh? Um, what is the experience on that, okay? The experience is that, uh, of course, uh, we have uh, more than 20 contracts. This uh, that I had mentioned are the most important one. Uh, what is the experience is that uh, there is, uh, first, uh, we have, uh, I cannot include uh, the number of tenders that we have done and, and failed means we are not just succeeding, we are failing also. Okay? About uh, 100 tenders, means that for the, for the, for the companies are very big effort. It is not just for, for nothing that we have this contest, okay? but it is worth, it is worth to have it. Uh, we have more than 20 contracts in execution, more than 40 million in contracts. That is, uh, it is good, it is not just for empresarios, it is for the consortium, uh, much bigger. 
We have about uh, 2,150 engineers with knowledge in ITER in all these disciplines, instrumentation and control, top and mat cooling water system, manufacturing and so on. But what is important, we are supporting 250 million liabilities, okay? Means that we are really helping in the investment, supporting 250 million. That is not, not a minor issue to be solved in terms of the companies and the consortium. We have uh, 50 engineers on site in Tadalach, and actually we have increased uh, a lot of expertise, very good expertise in thermohydraulics, for example. They are very critical operational modes of the tokamak cooling water systems. Some of them are easy, but some of them are complicated. Thermohydraulic tritium confinement, manufacturing of the farewell panels, means that we have passed to the Jurassic, to the real being an innovative uh, company. Okay, then uh, how we see the future, okay? Uh, I think uh, the development of the MOOC is a must, is a must for Europe. And we need to take this, mom this moment because the experience of empresarios agrupados, it is just one of the companies in Europe. But there is a big knowledge actually in, in Europe and big capacity in the industry in Europe. We need, uh, of course, to support the completion of ITER, the, the commissioning and operation. We should preserve this, uh, this knowledge of the industry for a long-term development. We can really probably do some specific actions on the regulatory framework, on the licensing for the MO, on starting with site studies. All of this it is absolutely needed if we like to transfer this knowledge of the industry we have to the fusion technology in Europe. And I think thanks for the invitation. It has been a real pleasure. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Teresa, um, to give us our view uh, of, of the industry. And yeah, working with the industry is very important. And we, we consider it very important that industry is involved in the very early de demo design, because what we want is to really design components which at the end can be manufactured by industry. But this means that we need to work also very closely with the politics in, in Brussels, uh, because we don't want to see that an industry is, is uh, penalized because they are involved in the early design and then later they cannot, uh, let's say, do the procurement. So there is something which we still need to improve. Uh, with these words, uh, we heard that there's um, often spin-off of technologies from fusion which are then going to industry. But sometimes the spin-off is in terms of people which are working in fusion, they're working on specific developments, and then they realize that, hey, wow, uh, there's a nice business case in this. We can try to set up a, a company. It's not always a, a, a very easy pass. It's sometimes a, a, a struggle. Uh, but we are very happy to have Wouter Fivers here, um, who will give us the insight. So he is the uh, founder of um, Chromo Dynamics, which is based in the Netherlands. So. Thank you, Tony, for the invitation. And well, it's an honor for me to uh, share with you the story of my company, Chromo Dynamics. Um, it's not just a story of my company, it's also, uh, let's say, a story of me as a person. And therefore, I would like to start out by just discussing a single word, which is very important to me, and that word uh, is impact, because it's a desire to have impact on society, uh, which has basically driven many of my choices in my career. Uh, basically, on my deathbed, I want to look back and know that my presence on Earth has resulted in a net positive effect. And that has also inspired me to um, yeah, start a PhD in 2006 <laughs> in uh, the field of fusion. I did this at uh, DIFFER, where I uh, worked on the development of the plasma source of magnum PSI, now also a facility for Eurofusion for uh, plasma wall interactions and, and heat exhaust research. 
Uh, but throughout my PhD, I already um, developed an interest and, and expertise in the development of new instrumentation for, uh, for plasmas. Then, um, late 2010, I moved to Switzerland. I started working um, in uh, Ambrosius Institute, uh, the Swiss Plasma Center at the EPFL. I was actually part of, uh, of one of these uh, training programs uh, for, for tokamak operations. Um, so I became a tokamak operator of TCV. Uh, I continued research in, in the area of power exhaust in tokamaks. And uh, yeah, again, throughout the five years there, I, uh, I remained interested and, and active in the development of new instrumentation and control systems. Um, well, as I'm talking, there's been a movie playing, um, which is of the masked tokamak. There's a super slow motion of what happens inside uh, the tokamak when, when there's plasma. And I've always been drawn to imaging technologies because uh, even without knowing exactly what, uh, what is going on here, it's immediately clear that a lot of uh, this, uh, such a video is very information dense. You can learn a lot about the shape of the, uh, the plasma, of the dynamics, of uh, all sorts of processes going on. Uh, you can tell from just a single movie. At some point in uh, 2014, I uh, wrote and eventually received a Dutch grant to uh, become the project leader for the development of a new camera system that could take this a step further. And this camera system was called Mantis. Uh, it's a so-called multispectral camera. Uh, but let me start with explaining the, the need for this. The, uh, what we wanted to do is advance to, uh, from uh, cameras providing visual information to uh, something that can provide actual measurements. So quantitative data at each pixel of uh, important plasma parameters like its temperature, its density, and its purity. And the analogy here is that uh, with a thermal camera, you can actually see what the temperature is, for example, of a, uh, in a building uh, that's on fire before you send your fireman inside. And uh, it's sort of that capability that we wanted, but then for this uh, super hot fusion plasma. Uh, well, this was uh, an international collaboration that was uh, eventually successful. So this is the installation of the de in device. It's, it's very large. My PhD student uh, was in uh, uh, 2018. And yeah, actually, uh, still today, it's, it supports the, the operation of the tokamak, the, the control systems, as well as the, uh, the scientific exploitation of TCV. And it's turning out to be also a uh, popular uh, diagnostic system uh, yeah, for visiting Eurofusion researchers. Then, um, we must see. Um, then there will be a, a movie playing soon uh, of just an example of uh, what sort of data this uh, uh, Merci. Uh, so what we see here is actually, it looks like nine separate videos. Again, it's a bit like uh, uh, the previous video. But what is special about this is that these were taken in a single two second period, all simultaneously. So this is light coming from the plasma that enters the camera and is sort of split out uh, into nine very specific colors. And, sort of, and in this set of colors, uh, sort of encoded a fingerprint of the plasma. So from this information, you can actually determine these plasma parameters. And this is unique. There's no other camera in the world that can do this. Otherwise, we would have bought it. So realizing this and realizing as well that there were dozens, maybe hundreds of uh, commercial applications for this, I took the plunge and in early 2019 founded Chromodynamics. The initial plans were uh, for, for the development of medical applications, in particular in surgery. Um, yeah, we uh, also wrote a grant for, for uh, a project together with a university in, in the production of pharmaceutical products and graphene. Uh, it seemed to be all successful in terms of technology. Uh, actually, what I failed to indicate here is that early 2020, we received a large multi-year contract for uh, the development of an instrument for ITER. So that's still going on, and we're actually building it this summer. Um, and we explored several other application areas. In fact, this fruit and vegetable sorting, uh, it's a large market, and we spent a year of our efforts on this. 
uh, we did product development for it to, to make the, the camera 30 times smaller while uh, it's significantly better. Um, and actually all of these applications are very worthwhile, they're valuable, uh, and, and they're large markets, but still we couldn't sort of get uh, the customers across the line in this last instance. It was, uh, basically the market wasn't quite ready for the, such a large leap forward in, in technology, while well, it's at the core of the fruit sorting machine. Um, so this is sort of a tricky situation to be in, and um, it's actually something that many startups uh, face. Actually, uh, about 40% or more than 40% of all startups fail due to insufficient market validation, at its co as it's called. And the way you can turn things around is that typically when you have a, uh, a tech transfer uh, project, you start with the technology, uh, you think about all the amazing things that it can provide, and you start talking to pe people in terms of would you like, are you interested in buying such a technology? But then the first answer is, well, show us. Where is it? Can we test it? Can we see it in, in, in uh, practice? Of course, you need funding to, to develop it further into a product. So if you go to a funding agency or, uh, or an investor uh, asking for money, then the first question back is, do you have paying customers? And this results in the old-fashioned game of Pong, where it's sort of impossible to get out of this, it seems. But by making a subtle but crucial change in the way you approach this, um, you, can, you can turn this around. So if you forget about the technology, if you just don't mention it at all and start talking to people about the challenges that they experience in their daily life, in their daily work, um, and a sufficient number of them come back with the same answer within a certain, um, let's say, a market segment, that they experience a problem and they are willing to, uh, to pay for a solution to it, uh, without even having mentioned how your technology works or what your product is, you can actually use this as the proof that there is a, a real need in the market for this, and then it's typically no issue to actually find the money. So uh, this is what we've now done over the past year, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to say that we, uh, well, we're on a, on, a, on a great path towards a beautiful pro um, uh, product. So, it's sort of back to the beginning, uh, biomedical research. So uh, these researchers analyze uh, thin slices of tissue, for example, from, from tumors, uh, put them on glass slides and fixate them. And these are analyzed with, uh, with microscopes, but there's now a need, in, in particular in the development of immunotherapies, so that's the use of the immune system to target cancer cells rather than using chemotherapy. In order to understand how these immune cells interact with the tissue and the cancer cells, there's a need to actually identify what the cells are that, that you're looking at, rather than relying on the visual information. So that's similar to the problem for the thermal camera and for firefighters or for the uh, fusion. You, don't, you want to move from visual information to quantitative data. There are some products on the market now that can do this, but they are very slow, uh, limited in their capabilities, and very expensive to operate. And uh, yeah, we, we get very clear indications from people that, they, are, uh, that they, they really need this. Uh, this is the type of image that this then produces. It's not ours, by the way. Um, but uh, these are images where each dot is a cell, and the color of each dot represents the cell type. So the user can actually switch on and off the different layers of the different cell types and, and really make a very in-depth study of how all the different cells interact. And this was previously only possible after separating the tissue into individual cells. But then you lose all spatial context and, and crucial information. So what we think we can do on the basis of uh, Mantis-derived technology is to do this seven times faster than the current state of the art uh, at 40% lower cost in, in consumables, and do this for uh, more than 30 cell types at, uh, in a single uh, staining cycle, where the current state of the art is about seven. Um, but this is a very complex uh, device. It's, uh, it's got uh, optics, mechanics, uh, moving parts, light sources, uh, software. So uh, yeah, we, we need uh, further funding for this. 
Um, now, with the business case uh, rounded up, uh, we, we are uh, actively pursuing the, the funding for this. Then we need talent as well, just like uh, we need in, in fusion research, and this is, uh, this is a challenge. Um, we're setting up a collaboration with a large academic hospital in the Netherlands to build a proof of concept uh, there in the next year. And once that is up and running, we need to secure further funding to, to finalize the product development and then hopefully introduce it to the market in about 2025 and further scale up in, in 2026 and onwards. So the timelines are also fairly long for this type of complicated technology. Um, but if we can do this, I'm convinced that we can help speed up the development of, of cancer treatments that are more patient-friendly and humane. And I think that this is a beautiful and very worthwhile goal, uh, something that has very personal meaning to me as well. And beyond this, we can even uh, advance this technology to, uh, towards di uh, the, the clinical practice and uh, as well explore the other applications once we have matured the technology and the market is more ready for it. So just uh, allow me to uh, provide you with a free take-home messages from my perspective as, as a founder of a, of a deep tech startup. So first of all, uh, this is a learning curve for me. Um, I've never been worried about the technology or even the money. But uh, this market validation is key. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a good idea in, in the broader scope of technology transfer to, to sort of facilitate people that are play, toying with the idea of starting a company and, and educating some, themselves about this but also uh, allowing them somehow to, to already explore this, this market early on. Then, um, yeah, these deep tech startups, of which there are many, uh, require sustained funding over longer periods, and typical venture capitalists want to see a return on investment within three to four years. So that's sort of a mismatch, um, but that's where the largest sums of money are which are required. Um, so having funding instruments in place that, that can sort of uh, yeah, help a young business through this uh, initial phase can be, uh, can be crucial. And then finally, if given sufficient uh, attention, uh, I've, I've seen many startups around me with all beautiful, uh, very meaningful applications that they are pursuing. And if you look at just what, what I believe that we can even con contribute to in terms of uh, sustainable development goals, then I think these tech transfer efforts can have a, a similar societal impact to, to the pursuit of fusion itself. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Wouter. It's also very inspiring to see that basically fighting cancer is also one of the spin-offs uh, which, which ultimately came from fusion, was started with research in fusion. So, very good. We are almost there, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just one more speaker to go. That's uh, Miss um, uh, Rosalinde van der Vlies, uh, who is uh, director of the Clean Planet Directorate. And she will tell us the way forward. So... Uh, please. I don't know what the slides, but you can use them. Okay, thank you very much uh, and uh, good morning. Uh, it's almost afternoon, but good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure and honor for me to be here uh, with you uh, this morning. And I would like to start uh, by congratulating uh, all of you and also congratulating uh, Eurofusion. I think this is really a very important milestone um, that we can all be very, very proud of. I would also like to thank uh, the uh, German uh, state Mecklenburg Vorpommern. I'm not sure I pronounced it correctly, but thank you very much um, for hosting this event uh, today on this also sunny day in Brussels. And I would also like to thank all the speakers uh, for very inspiring uh, presentations uh, this morning. Um, and I mean, for me, it is a big challenge now, of course, to have the closing uh, words in this very inspiring morning. Uh, and I'm sure that we will have a lot to talk about um, after we close um, today's event. So I think for me, it is extremely important that we now make sure um, that we keep the momentum. I think we have had enormous progress 
uh, in the last seven years. Uh, and I think it is really inspiring how the Eurofusion activities have been delivering these really important milestones. Um, and for me, one of the most memorable moments uh, was the press conference in February uh, on the world-breaking results of JET. Uh, and before I took on the job of the Clean Planet Director in DG Research uh, and Innovation, I was heading the communications unit uh, in the same director general, well, I can tell you what happened in February has been beating all the track records that we had in terms of media coverage. Uh, so it was really amazing to see, uh, you know, the, the outreach and also suddenly I had uh, my family in the Netherlands uh, calling me and saying, ah, I'm reading here something uh, uh, in the press. So this was, I think, a really extraordinary event uh, that, uh, that really uh, was very, very important. Uh, so now I think we have a challenging task ahead to keep this momentum and also to continue to reach out to a wider uh, audience uh, about the potential uh, of the fusion. Um, and the main objective of the Eurofusion uh, program in Horizon 2020 was to support uh, ITER uh, project. Um, and I think now it is important that we continue to share the information uh, with the ITER team uh, to continue to reduce the risks that we have, to reduce the time to ITER's full operation, and also to guarantee, of course, the success uh, of the experimental uh, program. And you can really count on the support of the European Commission uh, to continue uh, to make this uh, a success. And also, we are very much looking forward to continue cooperating with our international partners here. So I think building on the experience from our investment in the ITER uh, project, uh, it is important now that this will be reflected in the design of DEMO. The DEMO project, being currently in the research and development and conceptual design phase, uh, is under the responsibility of the Eurofusion uh, for the moment. However, um, in the next framework program, we expect the demo project to be transferred to the Fusion for Energy, which has really successfully building the partnership between the industry and research. ITER will require the dedication and enthusiasm of the next generation of scientists and engineers. And we are really happy that in the European Commission, our Commissioner for Research and Innovation is also responsible for education and training. And especially since this year is dedicated to youth, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of the need for education and training for the next generation. And I'm very pleased to see that the Eurofusion has put in place a full program in this respect. It is extremely important that we continue to train and educate our next generation. I also am very happy to see that industry uh, is very eager to contribute to the development of fusion. We have heard very interesting presentations uh, this morning. And of course, we need to communicate also that this is an area that can contribute to growth, jobs, and innovation for the European Union. And we really need to reap the benefits of the opportunity of ITER. Many industries across the European Union have been providing already state-of-the-art systems and components to ITER, as well as many other smaller-scale fusion research facilities. Moreover, fusion offers also opportunities for concrete investments, and we really need to make sure that we remain attractive for the industry to further invest in the research and development activities and that we also facilitate the technology transfer and the commercialization. So in the next two to four years, we are defining you know, the next research and innovation program. Uh, and if we want to meet the time frame of the Eurofusion roadmap, we must be well prepared and well coordinated. We need to know what we want to achieve in the future and how we want to achieve it. And here the European Commission is also looking at the member states for further cooperation and to agree on really a coherent program that we will be delivering together. Let me conclude by recalling the words earlier this morning of Deputy Director General Joanna Drake uh, on the very important political momentum that we are facing in Europe despite all the challenges we have. It is very clear that the European Union wants to lead and wants to be the first climate neutral continent in the world 
by 2050. So let's really reap the benefits of also this political momentum and also make sure that the fusion energy will be delivering and contributing to the long-term low-carbon transition. And you can count on the support of the European Commission. We will be continuing to providing significant support through the Euratom programme. And it is clear that the fusion energy will become a reality in the future if we continue to work very, very closely together. I think we have a fundamental question to answer, and this is when can the European Union meet its carbon neutrality target, and what can be the role of fusion energy in this respect? And I would really invite you together to define a scientifically sound answer to this question to make sure that we in the European Union and beyond can really reap the benefits of the fusion energy. So let me conclude with this very challenging uh, but also promising task. Congratulate all of you for this very successful event today and I wish you very continued success in all your endeavours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. van der Vlies, for these uh, very nice and inspiring words. Um, yeah, we, we are ready to, to work and uh, to end with some famous words of uh, Lexa Simovic, who said one, when he got a journalist to ask him, when is the fusion? And then he said, fusion will be there when society needs it. Of course, we cannot be there directly tomorrow. We still need to do some research. but. We can do it, and we can even do things a little faster, but we need to treat it as a man on the moon project. It's important enough. Uh, Sibylle already mentioned it earlier today that basically uh, fusion is an energy source where the fuel is all over in the world, so this would avoid wars for fuel, for oil, for gas, etc., and it will make the world a, a safer place. So, and, and we are doing our best to get there. So. Thank you all. Uh, so also to all the other speakers, thank you for your inspiration, your wise words, your view. And uh, we hope you have enjoyed. Maybe you have missed the little movie which was in the program. We skipped that because we had uh, problems with the connecting to the audio. Um, so we will make sure that the link will be posted somewhere and people can, uh, can watch it. It's a very nice video which basically says we need your 20 watts because the human brain basically works on 20 watts. It's unbelievable how efficient we are. And we need to tap in the 20 watts of all of you. Not all of you, but also the students. And actually the students are quite now the young generation. And it wasn't one of the slides, but it was not mentioned. They are gathering exactly today and this week uh, in Padua with massive numbers to basically discuss also their view on the future. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you all. And uh, there's still a light lunch uh, outside. Uh, I understood there's some people from the press, so if you would like to uh, talk to some of the people, uh, I, I'm not sure whether everyone will be around for a long time, but uh, well, I would say grab your chance and, and talk to people. So thank you again and see you next time. And may, maybe once more, thanks for the, uh, for the representation here of Mecklenburg for Pomeran for making this facility available. It's, it's, it's very much appreciated. So thank you. Thank you.